Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, here we are. This is the uh, fifth uh, lecture I given the last one in this series. Um, uh, thank you so much so far. You know, thank you, Deering, for uh, letting me do these. And uh, uh, let's just uh, jump right in. We have <clears throat> two subjects I want to talk about. We haven't touched on yet, really. And the first one is about uh, uh, musical architecture, I called it, which is actually called form, musical form. I sometimes like to call it architecture because uh, uh, it is also related to, to, to architecture that we live in, that we enjoy. Like, you know, we have an entrance and it's like an intro. Uh, you have a main room, you know, you have a, you know, you have the different uh, 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 parts of a church that were, you know, put into music as architecture. So architecture and the musical form sort of sometimes we're related in a, in a, in a way. And so I want <clears throat> to just start off, you know, by, um, uh, of course, you know, this, <laughs> both of these subjects would feel, would fill uh, uh, libraries uh, full of uh, uh, information. And I just really want to keep it so it's banjo and, you know, uh, American folk music related, maybe, you know, just mostly, but maybe I can help you understand a few things or clarify a few things. So first of all, uh, there's, there's a, uh, we have, you know, like a chord, a chord. And in, in the, in the, and if we, if we want to wander away from that chord and we go, let's say to a five chord, and then we go back to the one chord, that's called a cadence. Now, <clears throat> that would be a perfect cadence, but I'm not going to go into all the technical details. I'm just saying, you know, it's a cadence. Of cadence is one that goes from, from the five to the one. And uh, uh, the, the plagal uh, cadence it would be from four to one. But because music has a, a tension and a relief, um, we want to, you know, establish our understanding. What is the tension and what is the relief? And then we put it into musical. We put it into musical form. When we go uh, in his music history back, and we look at the Baroque times, uh, there was different musical uh, uh, concepts in counterpoint. Uh, but there were musical forms like the suite and you know um, orchestral pieces, uh, uh, orchestral suites, and so forth. But <clears throat> I'm going to stick not to the counterpoint era of, of, of music history. I want to be more in the, in the uh, classical uh, uh, Vienna classics when it started really to where the melody would take over and the harmony would put what was laid underneath a melody. Uh, because that's what we still do in, in our folk music here in America. Not necessarily in the old Irish music, for instance, but uh, in 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 the American folk music, we have chords and we have melodies on top, or we have melodies and then we build chords around them. We build a harmony structure underneath them. So let's just look at the, the chord structures because they are important for the foundation of this architecture. So uh, when, we, when we look at uh, a G chord and that has no tension, so it feels like we're breathing out. But as soon as I go to the uh, let's say five seven chord uh, a D seven. See, there's a tension, dominant seven chord. If I just let this stand, it doesn't feel like it's the end of things. But here, right? So, and I can stay, let's say, longer on that on that tension. can see it, it resolves. Now, when we have a piece uh, uh, like uh, children music, we have uh, one call and one answer, and it usually it ends with this cadence, you know? So let's say we have Cripple Creek. And then with cadence, right, see that? So it puts it to an end. So we have all these things that come before, and then we have a, a cadence 
uh, uh, either plagal or uh, just uh, uh, authentic is the other one. You see, I'll, I, of course, I don't have to play that when I play the melody, but this is what the so that's a one call da da ba dum ba da bum answer da ba da ba dum ba dum bum and that concludes that sentence now uh, but we like longer conversations you know as we get older and so we have uh, uh, and I always like to take the 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 piece salt creek as a um, as a measure so if you if you look here so I go and the, see and in the fourth in the fourth bar in the end of that fourth bar I'm going to the D chord and the five chord and that doesn't resolve so in the end of the four bars where in Cripple Creek we have it already ended and said and done the the five chord comes in the end of that and that gives us that sense that oh it's got to continue see i can't stop there really and so i'm having the same uh, call again and then i end it again cadence and back So uh, now we have, uh, th this is what's, what's called a, a theme, right? I have this theme. And I have that set in eight bars with in the middle, that small uh, 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 middle cadenza, it's called. And, and I, can, I can jump right back into it. What happens with the other chords they can vary actually a lot, but in, in folk music you find a lot of these, this form is very, very dominant. And so then we have a second part, a B part, and that B part is usually almost the same length, you know, like, like the A part. Now either it can be uh, repeated, like the second part. So uh, that, that would be one time through. And so uh, I can either repeat that, that would be a form. So it's an A-A-B-B -B form. Or we have like in uh, pieces like uh, uh, theme time, we have an A-A-B-A -A 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 form. So the A actually comes back. So I have the... <laughs> It just repeats and it goes same part. And A part again. But it's gonna be A2. So we have A, A2, B, A2. Now uh, uh, there's there's a lot more forms like that. Like Bill Monroe, for instance, you know, he would write a lot of instrumentals where he would add a third part on top of this. Now that's been done a lot <clears throat> in old time music, just to stretch out the tunes, you know, to, to end, to sort of add a tag. Now, if you're the only solo instrument, for instance, and you constantly just repeat A, B, A, B, you know, like, and it's always square, it's always like four bars or eight bars, and, and it's eight bars and 16 bars, um, it, the mind actually doesn't get surprised that much anymore. You really start to understand that form and you just sort of let it go. But when you, um, when you start uh, adding just a little bit of a tag to it, it starts, you can then start over again because you got out of that form. So uh, for instance, in Boatsman, A2, B1. B2, and now, but that only comes once, so, uh, uh, 
See, or um, let's say you listen to Earl Scruggs, he would play in Foggy Mountain Breakdown, he would play the A part three times in a row, and then the fiddle comes in, plays it twice, banjo comes in, plays it twice, and sometimes we play three times just to break it up, you know. Um, or in Sally Ann, where Earl Scruggs would play. And then comes the second part. Again. Again. So he would just play the, th the, the second part three times instead of just two times. And these little things keep the attention um, of the listener with you a lot more because, whoa, he's, he's still playing. Uh, because you would internally you would expect another instrument to take over, you know. So uh, then there's also the form that's been used, you know, in, in a lot of folk musics around this world. It's called the rondo form, where you have um, an A part, then you have a B part. You play the A part again, and then you have a C part. But that's mostly done by uh, playing the A part in, in G, let's say, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the time. Then you go uh, to, to, to the dominant in the second part, and then the third part goes to the subdominant, and then you go back to, to, the, to, the, to, the, uh, um, to the key. So you have G, that part, then you play that part in D, play this part in G, play this part in, uh, in, in, C, in, in, in C, and then play this part in G again. So that, that, was, that was a great musical form. Um, I, I compose a lot in this form myself because I can string things together and have multiple ideas come again and again, uh, have that main section come again and fill the in-between. with. And this is mainly for my instrumental music. Then I also see form, musical forms, you know, they're interesting, they are not actually resolving. You know, they, they're always, they have two cadenzas that actually don't don't resolve. They're like two middle cadences. Like when if I would play, here. see here here's here's the here's that five. You know, to go back. resolve and then even now I could go back to D but I do a, a, a transition into a, into a modernization now I have another five and go to G major So, so I'm playing that second part in in G major, and then, and then go, and then come back out of the second part into the first part again. So it's like an A A B A, but stretched far apart. Now, to to keep a musical conversation up, when you see what I just did. So that's that's like da 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 ba da 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 no, it's just a random, I just play something. 
it's not just some notes being connected. I'm always trying to have something that I say musically, and then I have a response to that. And I always really uh, keep my ear on that when I come up with something because I I want people to to hear, even if you don't realize it as a conversation, you sort of, you know, obviously don't realize it, but it sounds musical because I'm saying something and then like here. But you can see that's the answer, you know. Um, uh, <clears throat> then what is important in a lot of songs, you know, bluegrass music has a, a, a lot of times, you know, the, the banjo or fiddle, mandolin to start off a song with sort of a turnaround or, you know, playing first part of the, the verse. And, um, and then Chorus, verse starts, you know, and then you have maybe chorus, verse, chorus, and then you have solo. And it always sticks to these two main themes that the song is all about, you know, the verse and the chorus, either as solo or as as, the, as singing. Now, as soon as you move into a little bit of pop music, you have something what's called the bridge. You always have a part that's towards the end of the song. Uh, it's like in a drama, when you watch a Hollywood drama, um, you know, I, I spent so many, you know, <laughs> times in airplanes where there was no individual screen and they would, you know, have these romantic comedies play with no end until the entire airplane would go, no, not again. <laughs> but in these romantic comedies, you can see always the same thing, you know, they meet each other, there's this thing, and then all of a sudden there's the conflict, and then there is the silent moment, and that's like the bridge, and then it resolves uh, you know, into this happiness that you thought it should be from the beginning. And, but then it's this silent moment, usually with filled with music, no dialogue much. And there's just this, you know, they're devastated. You never know if they come together again, and all that, blah, blah. But uh, that section is like the bridge in music, you know. So you have a song that goes through, but all of a sudden you have this thing that seems like it's out of place, it comes from somewhere else, it goes into a new direction, and that's called the bridge. Now, in bluegrass music, that's not very common. You don't have many of these bridges, you know, in traditional music in particular. You you have really verse chorus based, you know, ideas. Um, what we started doing, you know, or for our music, because we don't have that many soloists, you know, in our band, um, I would come up maybe with a part that has nothing to do with the verse or the chorus. Like we would sing, you know, all the places I have been to, all the things that I have seen. And then comes the chorus. Then A again. And then when that stops, I don't play this, the verse or the chorus. I come up with something that didn't, that wasn't there before. I go. So that that wasn't in the song, but it becomes like an interlude, something that is different, uh, that that I feel sounds good to be played between before the verse starts over again and the chorus starts over again. And so it's not really a bridge, but it's a new part. And so it's like A, B, C, A, B, C, something like that. So I'm saying this all because when you're playing in a band or you're arranging music, these are all really important tools, you know, to, to, that you could use. You know, if you have an arrangement, for instance, um, you could take Cabin and Caroline and then have it in G, but when the solo comes, you play it in a different key and then go back. Um, where, where was that? I, I, I did a, a, two tours, I think, with Jim Eanes, and he had a, a tune called Little Old Log Cabin in the Lane. And uh, 
he had sang it in F, and then when um, uh, um, the banjo player came in, Alan Shelton, he would then start that solo in G. It was very powerful uh, because he couldn't really play out of F, so they just shifted it into G. So if the singer plays a song in F and you don't really uh, want to, you have a better solo playing in G, why don't you just play the solo in G and then go back to F? That doesn't hurt anything. I think it, it grabs the attention of people. Um, uh, these musical forms are, you know, a great tool not to play more notes, but to have arrangement skills that just give you more, more edge, you know, on a song uh, where you can actually f uh, deliver more things, you know, um, entertainment value without being confusing. A lot of times, uh, just adding more notes doesn't make the music more understandable, you know. Uh, a lot of times it's, e it's simpler just to reduce the music a little bit and let the arrangement speak a little bit more. You know, have something interesting going on musically, you know, where it's just, oh, it's, I can follow all this, but it's interesting to be on that ride, right? So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is helpful to you. <laughs> it helps me a great deal, you know, uh, knowing uh, about about this piece. Like, for instance, uh, in the moment, I'm commissioned to write um, a, a suite, uh, uh, a sonata, I'm sorry. Um, um, I, I write a sonata, so uh, for, uh, moonshine. <laughs> moonshine sonata. <laughs> and uh, and the, the, son, the, the sonata form, you know, is a form where you... Um, Sort of, you know, uh, you 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 show a theme, you know. That's usually um, the sonata form. You know, um, you show a theme. Let's say, let's say, what, what theme could I think? Um, uh, yeah, that would be good. That's just an old time tune, like. <laughs> would be something. So I play this twice. And now comes the second part. And the second part actually really goes to five. Something like that. Okay, so that five and then it goes and that starts over again in that in that first section. Now in the, sonata, uh, in, the, in the sonata form, you know, you would do that A and that B, which is usually on the dominant, do that twice. Um, and then you start to develop these, these two themes. And development, you know, could be long, could be short. And then after that, so development would be like if I have... So that's, that's just an idea. So it could... So it could That's an idea. was still in the musical form so if I had a bass player along you know who, who plays along but uh, it would still fit into what the others were sort of you know in the form in the length but in, uh, but in the in the development of a theme you are very free you could actually do whatever and then let everybody know what you're planning to develop and the music takes on a totally different dimension um, so that's the difference you know when we when we look at a sonata, an old sonata, you would have to have it written so the the, the development part uh, can become very complex, very long, very different. You can have and you know all kinds of ideas that all of a sudden become something completely new, um, but they're still sort of related to this to these two main themes. And you interweave them, you put them in minor, you can go to all kinds of places, but you cannot 
very well improvised with a lot of other people because they need to know what you're doing. And so you compose you compose these uh, these developments and then you tell everybody what the chord structure is of that development. In the end, you go back and play the original sort of uh, recognizable again in the original key and sort of end in the original key. And that would be one of the uh, sets, you know, of a of a sort of a sonata. Uh, if uh, I, I've written, you know, uh, but let's stay with the sonata, yes, but but because that 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 showing the themes and then improvising on it is what we actually do in bluegrass music. You see, we have a, a, a tune that say Sally Goodman or um, Gold Rush. So the fiddler comes in, he plays the melody really and shows the people that's the melody. Now, uh, then maybe the, the mandolin comes in and starts playing it, and it starts playing the melody, but it's already free to actually do a little bit more than the fiddler was in the first run through, because the people already know the melody and the mandolin is you know, playing the melody, but then all of a sudden breaking out a little bit, doing a little bit more. And, and uh, uh, but, the ma if, but if it would be a mandolin piece and he would start off as a mandolin piece, he wouldn't do any uh, developments in the first run through really. And that's what you also see with um, uh, jazz players, you know, they play the head, we call it, and and then you have the other musicians, you know, taking over. Usually, you know, uh, then you have a trumpet, you know, they all play, and then maybe the trumpet starts off, you know, just coming out of the head and just taking over and going on for as long as he pleases. You know, tries to develop that idea of that of that head over the chord structure and melodious ideas, just sort of mixed. But the harmonic structure is still basically the same as in the head, you know, but the development is still like a sonata, you know, when you, when you, when you would think about it. Now, in a concerto, of course, you know, that would be a solo piece for a solo instrument with, you know, uh, orchestra uh, behind it. Um, that's a different, it's a little bit different, you know, but it's a similar thing. You would have themes that you, that you show then you have an exposition and then you have a, re, a, re, a recap of that in the end, you know. And it's the same with jazz, you know. Everybody goes off and the end everybody comes together and they sort of, you can recognize the beginning head again. Uh, now in bluegrass, in the beginning, I don't think that was so dominant to be so virtuoso and so personally um, uh, sh uh, showing the, the development of things. You actually wanted to play just a tune and uh, that was enough. So everybody's playing uh, what their take on their melody on this, but they wouldn't wander off too far. In the 70s, you know, when chromatic banjo style, they call it chromatic when people would play a uh, melodic. Uh, when people do that, that's what they would call chromatic. And, the traditionalists didn't like it so much because they would wander off too far from the melody a lot of times uh, for no reason other than to to play the licks that they liked and uh, which is perfectly fine i would say it shouldn't but uh, but then you know more and more it became uh, you know guitarists in particular like you see the ricky skaggs band you know uh, with jim mills you know playing 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 banjo he would play he wouldn't wander off too much with the banjo, but the guitarist would. The big guitarist, you know, would play all over the place, you know, not even recognizing the tune anymore, almost. You know, it was so, would be 90% of the notes, you know, would be really far away from anything recognizable to the tune. A lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, you know, especially in the fast show off pieces. You show off how far off can you wander and still keep it and hold it together. That's part of the art, you know, in modern, more modern bluegrass. Um, and of course, when you when you look at Earl Scruggs in the development, you know, in Foggy Mountain Breakdown, uh, you know, he had these he had these variations that he would do order, you know, which is basically the same. Or all these different you know ideas that he would throw in, but they would be maybe a handful. There wasn't there wasn't there wasn't like buckets of it. <laughs> I'm not saying it's better or not. I'm I'm not judging any of this. I just uh, uh, it's nice to understand, you know, that these music forms are connected because of these relations of how 
uh, improvisation gets treated in musical form. So uh, uh, what, what else do I have? Yes, I think, well, yeah. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, I think I could talk about, you know, uh, uh, each of these things, you know, in, in length, but it, it is just nice if you, if, you, if you look at a tune and you try to understand where is the, where's the cadence, where does it, where does it resolve, where does it, where does it go? So I, I think that's good to know. Where is the, where is the tension? Where does it build up? And where is the call? And where is the answer? If you start listening to music with that in mind, uh, that helps you a, a great deal, you know, to understand, also remember a lot more music because you actually looking at it as a conversation, not just an endless string of music that just just runs runs by you. And maybe I could say, you know, there's in jazz, you know, you have you have the same concepts, but they're just more more complex. And I will talk about that, you know, in the chord structures a little bit, you know. Um, also, the melody lines don't necessarily are, you know, catered as call and answer. Uh, they 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 are a little bit differently organized, and um, of course, you know, different aspects of chords would also be of of structure would be the blues, uh, twelve bar blues, you know, and all all the things that are involved in that to play blues. But I think I would really like to um, uh, do an entire, you know hour on blues or something that that would be really uh, fantastic to do i hope this was helping you a little bit and what do you think dave we move on to the next subject i, I think I, I think that's that's you know it's well you wrapped it up well and i, th I think that's helped everybody get, you know show the general framework and architecture of, of how music how western music works yeah all right that's good. Okay, I, I hope uh, I don't see the I don't see comments. So <laughs> see. Uh, that's all right. Okay, glass of drink of water. So we do have one comment from Dan Mazer asking if he, if you've written any through composed pieces. Yes, I have, but. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, there's a lot of there's. But I did a lot of exercise, you know, to studying, you know, composition, uh, you know, writing twelve tone music, uh, you know, with matrices and uh, going through different styles and analyzing different uh, things. So I've I've done a lot of um, a lot of different different ideas, you know. But I'm mainly a banjo player. <laughs> I'm mainly banjo. But you know, but if I write a orchestra suite or a symphonic uh, a symphonic evening like for for Ogden or music from the spring it's uh, it helps me you know to understand musical form a little better to to really get a bigger idea you know across over an evening you know to have a have a larger piece of music you know if I let's say I get a let's say I get a, a asked to to write a a, a a piece for string quartet by Chamber Music America, you know, so, and then I wonder, you know, what form am I going to put this in? I'm going to make a suite and what I want to do, you know, um, and, and then I, I write out, you know, what pieces do I have and, and uh, um, how many pieces, uh, how long are there approximately and, you know, where's the main piece and then I write out the main themes, what I want to hear for it. And then I saw so I can construct it because I have an idea of um, how I want to uh, uh, do the exposition and then how I don't want to do the development and maybe have part of the development do just by the orchestra or um, or together, you know, or whatever, you know, all these these different parts. Because if I would just, you know, come from a, um, if I wouldn't think, you know, in a bigger sort of idea, uh, it would be very difficult, you know, to to finish a forty-minute piece. You know, my, my my pieces are usually around forty minutes that I write for orchestras or symphonies, and uh, and so it helps me a lot just to have a lot of uh, different ideas in my head of how I can, can could construct this, like for the new sonata. 
uh, I'm writing, you know, which would be like a sonata, typically, you know, two, three parts. Um, uh, but I do an opening and, uh, and an ending, so it's going to be five parts. And it wouldn't be actually a real sonata because a sonata usually, in a traditional sense, would be more played by a solo piece, solo musician, maybe playing with one or two people. Uh, but, but, you know, as soon as you have a, a larger orchestra play, actually a sonata, you would call it a symphony, you know. But uh, so, so the, the lines are watery, you know, and you have uh, the piano sonatas, you know, written by, by the greats, you know, by, they have only two, two sections or two parts. And they don't even follow really the, the, the idea of, of a sonata. But for them, that was the idea of the sonata that they had for that idea. And I think uh, that's all legitimate, you know. But the sonata is something that's been around for so long, you know, with showing something that is there and then improvising on it. And that's what we really do in progress music a lot. And real quickly, before we move on to the next topic, um, we have a question from Charlie Brown that I think it's good about all these classes we've been doing. He says, can you transfer these lessons to other instruments, even the vocal instrument? Yeah, definitely, I would say. I mean, I... I, uh, yes, definitely. I mean, um, when you, uh, yes, of course, <laughs> of course, you know, singing, singing is an instrument. It's the same. Yes, definitely. You know, I mean, that's what, that's what you see, you know, when you have the bridge, the singer is singing the bridge, you know, in a, in a pop song, you know, usually. So the vocal does it just the same. All right. Well, uh, move on to the second half of, 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 of the class here. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, you have to forgive me, you know, because I'm only scratching on the surface of this of these subjects. But I just maybe want to also encourage you uh, to find interest in these subjects and then search further. You know, there's a lot of things to learn out there, and uh, and maybe you find, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that, that I was interested in that. And maybe you want to learn more and you know find people that can tell you that better than I do. <laughs> For me, sometimes you know. I, I like to talk about it, but, you know, my main thing is that I have to do it. You know, I have to write this music, you know, so it's a different thing. So let's move on to the to the chords. I said, you know, how to how to connect chords that, of course, I will not be able to answer. But I will give you some ideas, you know, of how I look, how, how I look at it or how I got started in connecting chords or making chords flow better. Um, I realized when I was, I was a kid that if I had a, a, a G chord here and then a G chord here and then a G chord here, I, they're the same G chords, but they have different, you know, uh, the root is somewhere else and the fifth is somewhere else, third is somewhere else, inversions. So, so when I have chord structures um, that I have a G here and I want to go to D, I would probably not go here if I'm in a background somewhere, you know, behind a melody, because that's a lot of movement and it could interfere with the melody. So um, it could, maybe sometimes it doesn't, but a lot of times it does, you know, it doesn't sound so smooth. If I just go, you know, have a G here and I go to a D here, to a C here, and then a G here again, maybe not so good. Uh, and so the, 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 the inversions of the chords are very important. So I would just G, D, G, you know, G7, C here. So I try to, to connect the chords, you know, with inversions closer to where I am. It's very important to know the different chord shapes on the instrument. Uh, because when you have, let's say, you have a melody. And I want, I know that this G, E, G, G, E, G, E, G, E, C, for instance. <laughs> G, G, E, D. So I have G, E. You know, so I know this is a C chord, so I use the C chord to go with my melody note. So I can lay the harmony underneath the melody line that's on the first string. Uh, on the first string, we can hear the melody mostly the best, you know. But if we have, and of course, if we have more chord structure, like G, D, D, G7, right, yeah. For instance, or, and then D. B, E, G7, C, C sharp, C sharp diminished, and then the 
but you see the melody is always the same i didn't change the melody i just changed the chordal structure underneath it and because if i know there's a there's a c9 here you know it it doesn't really help me if i know if i only know this c9 here or this one uh, or, or this one because i need to have the one that's close to where my melody is So it's from every chord type that you have, it's just convenient because then you can have the melody on top, uh, you know, if the melody is not too fast, if it's, and that's great with singing songs, the melodies are usually not so fast as by fiddle tunes, and then you can add the chord structure underneath. But this is not really only what I want to talk about. I really want to talk about uh, the, uh, the concept of how, to, how you smooth, smoothly go from one chord to the next. Well, there's... Uh, there's a few uh, concepts of doing that um, and there's transition chords from one chord to the next I'll we'll talk about that in just a few minutes but first of all I like the concept of common tone I use that a lot I set up an idea um, where I use let's say I have a G and I want to go to A minor let's say or I want to go to C it says it's a bit simpler, simpler I go to C and I already go it during G. So, da, da, ba, da, 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 da. so I go da, ba, da, 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 da. So I already put the C there before it's even there. So I can go. Sometimes, you know, just moving already. In the, in the direction of the chord uh, really helps the chord to be smooth because I if I if I have a G chord let's say open here and I just change one note and I change another note and another note again another note so I change one or two notes at the time but always make sure one note stays stays the same then all the chords actually sound like they belong to each other. See, if I have a passage... That would be a piece... See, I'm only changing one note at a time. But I, I constantly try to keep one note there. So, and that makes it all really smooth. You can practice that by not really understanding the chords you play, but just listening. And that's a, a non music theoretically a theoretical approach, which I started when I was a, a kid. And then later, of course, I learned the chords, you know, what the names are and all that. But, but in the beginning, I was just listening. And so forth. You can you can do anything. And I only leave. I always make sure. I I always I make sure that I just keep one of the notes standing, and that gives me a common tone. Now in Beethoven's times, that was uh, one of the important theories uh, to open up to all keys at any given point. You know that was that was something that um, wasn't practiced so much before. But if you have a G here, and then I go, and I just see it sounds. Uh, 
you can you can just sort of wander through through chord movements by and it all seems to sound musically now when you take a chord progression that you really like for instance this So, so that's a nice passage. Okay, so uh, record that on a little tape recorder and then come up with a melody on top of that. So you see, so that's, 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 and then, or something, you, you just, record a, a chord structure that you connected like that and then you try to find a melody over that and that will open up a lot of doors for you to 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 create music because all of a sudden the doors are pushed open um because you're not necessarily just going from g and to c and then, then to d to g you start to open up different doors now uh, we talked about the uh, the cadence before now if let's say you're you're in 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 in, in e minor and uh, or let's stay with G minor, G minor. Let's stay with G minor. And now the five chord would be, of course, the D again, right? So if if you if you try to transition chords like okay, and then I go to D, go back to G. So that was a nice was a nice movement. So as long as you land some sometime on that five chord, you know you come to a sort of okay here it starts again, and then you do the same thing again. So you can establish a tune. If you then would just keep on going, it would be difficult to establish a tune. You you um, you know you find something that connects nice, and you you keep it in that conversational call and answer idea with the chords that sort of connect. And then you record and say, oh, I really like that. I start off a lot of times with very simple things like. Because I just think that's, that was nice. And then I record it or listen to it and I, till, till I can develop it into something else. Okay. So that's just, that's just chords moving in himself, you know, just moving, moving around in, in our, you know, regular world in country bluegrass jazz excuse me um and, and other kinds of music we use passing chords you know a, a lot like for instance we have a g chord and we go to c the most common one of course is g7 and go to go to go to c um, we add that flat flat and seven to, to go to, go to g and but we could we could add a lot more than that i will just go into get into that but as a child again I, it's, I realized it's very important to understand where you want to go. So, for instance, uh, I, I'm a G. I want to go to C here, this C. And I, I said to myself, okay, I want to go from this G to this C. Right? So what, what could be in between this and this? Well, if I look at it in a musical way, I want it to be somewhere... So it's so it's getting it's almost C, but it's not C yet. So if I move this middle finger up to the fifth fret, I'm already I'm already on C a little bit. And I go that, or I could move the index finger up a half step, which gives me an augmented chord. Yeah. Or I play an entire chord where I where I just go like from B 
but you see the B still stays the same. So, so when I was a kid, you know, I just tried to connect, but if I would go from G, I don't want to go to A minor. Right? For instance, I know I know if I go from G, I need to go to this E minor. What lies in between these two chords? Which, what could I, could I move? Yeah, it's, it sounds good, you know, because I'm, I'm moving already towards up there. I couldn't move the entire chord up. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just... <clears throat> The, the, the problem is if I didn't, you know, if I play this and I say, okay, I'm going to, okay, I like this. So I know it's a G-shock diminished and I can communicate to my guitarist, you know, or to Uwe or to, to Joel, okay, it's a G-shock diminished. And uh, I can tell him that that's easier sometimes, you know, if I, if I know what I'm, what I'm going to do. Um, and that's, that's what it is. You know, music theory is about uh, communication also you know a great deal like for instance if i would know how to write for the oboe or for all the other instruments how could i write to the orchestra it wouldn't help me if i have it in my head but if i don't know how the french horn works i need to learn uh, something about the french horn or the oboe or uh, you know the bassoon and all the the kettle drums you know everything so so i can communicate so it's about communication a lot of things a lot of understanding of these, to express it has a lot to do with communication, you know. But basically, it is what lies in between, you know. It, I just move something that is almost, it's like when I go from here and I want to go to C here. I use this G here to go up here because I like this and I kind of do a G7. G and let's stick down here so we can see it better. Or, or combine them, flat seven down here, augmented here, and play C. You know, and this, this is a beautiful chord. This augmented, you know, uh, this 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 uh, sharp five, flat six, and uh, this flat seven, and then you go to the C chord. And all of these chords have a corresponding scale to them. You know, like for instance, for this chord you would use a whole tone scale, which is just... And the pattern... And the, so, yeah. Now, it's not necessary that if, let's say, you can play the chord and nobody else needs to play that chord, you know, in the bluegrass situation. Sounds pretty good. Fiddlers do it all the time. They play all kinds of connection notes, which the guitarist is not playing and the mandolin and the banjo. They just add these notes as, as, a, as a lift into something that uh, makes it sound real good, you know, or this thing. You know, these, these things that fiddlers do all the time, they add these notes that nobody else is playing in the chord. And uh, that's what I'm talking about. So there's uh, uh, another one that's, that's very common in, in, in music, and that's a flat, flat nine. And if you combine that flat nine with a flat seven, you actually become, you, only, you get a diminished chord again. So a uh, diminished chord, you know, meaning stacked minor thirds. So 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 if you want to uh, connect that, you can play it as an arpeggio. You know, just as a, as an arpeggio, or uh, you could play it as a scale and. It's very simple, the scale of a diminished. All you have to do is, if you take a diminished chord, and the scale would be like you take from each each and every, every one of these notes, doesn't matter which one it is, you know, you just start off and uh, and just go two, two frets up, one, 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 one note. Right, so you see that? So, so, so I have, let's say I have this, this diminished scale here. 
So I. So that would be like a whole tone, half tone, whole tone, half tone. See, because the diminished scale, because it's minor thirds, repeats like that. And then if you would take every second step, so. That would be a, like a harmonized uh, diminished scale. So it's very simple. If you see a, a diminished chord like that, all you have to do is, you see, you see, I have the chord here, and I go. So, so if I have a G, I have a bridge to go to C, right? Does it make sense? Or yeah. Yeah. so the diminished, you know, let's stay let's stay with this this, this flat nine. So if I want to uh, combine the flat nine with the with the augmented down here I'm, I need a new scale to actually cover uh, all of this and it's called the altered scale so it starts off with uh, 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 root and then flat nine flat three and then three flat five and then flat six flat seven so and that would be like an F sharp uh, uh, it would be like an F sharp without the root. Okay, so F sharp scale without without the without the F sharp as a root. So, um, but no, we don't think we don't think that way. We look at it just as uh, not, that would be uh, one of one of these scales that would go would go over this chord here. Great. The diminished works great to go to minor. Yeah. So um, that's just to find now these chords. Once you know this diminished, you know that you can you can use that to go to C. Um, now the diminished chord is also a great tool actually to go backwards uh, to go to go in the circle of fifths. So you go G. And you want to go to D. We only talked now how to go to, to the subdominant, but how do we get to the dominant? So to the dominant, we can go over the over the two and to the five. Uh, so we go over the, the two minor, go to five. Uh, we could even go to one and two major five. That's a good transition. So that you can always use that as chord going to the five. But it was also as great, you can use the diminished. You just take the G and you just make a G diminished, right? And then you go to D. And then when you D, you take a D diminished and go to A, A, A diminished, go to E, and so forth. You can uh, go the entire circle of fifths with the diminished. So once you learned uh, the diminished scale, uh, you can start, you know, just improvising on the diminished scale. But we're not talking about improvising or jazz, we're talking about just the chord structures, how to connect them. Um, I like the, the, the second dominant, that's what's called, you know, if I play G and I play an A and then I go to D, that's, that's the second dominant, that's the dominant of the D, the A. So that's a great tool when you, when you go, um, uh, when, you, when I play... So uh, uh, the second dominant, uh, major or minor, and then G, so A minor, D, G, A, A minor, D. Uh, tonight I'm alone without you, my dear. It seems that I'm laughing for you. Yeah, 
Yeah, you have to be careful not to sound too jazzy all of a time, all of a sudden. But uh, uh, going from G to C one more time, you could also then use a minor for that. You know, you could actually use a, 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 a D minor to go to G as a substitution, or a G or a plain F minor. The I know that sounds maybe all a little bit confusing and all a little bit much, and it's just like a bucket of information. But whatever you you find that you like, you know, like, and you go over over a, a flat going to the, to the C, B, and then going to C, and then if you do that again now, going back to G, uh, playing an F sharp. I establish a, a idea, a feeling, because I not just played it once, I use it more than once. That gives me, that gives us a sense of uh, flavor because it's reoccurring. Now, if, if something, if an idea just comes once, um, it's like in Autumn Leaves, you know, if you, when you have a, a minor, a minor seven flat nine chord, it comes again and again and again, and that, that flavor sort of, you know, then shapes a little bit this idea. And that's the same with, with any idea. As soon as I establish an idea, a movement, and if I, if I only do this, that's okay. But if I go, see, all of a sudden it becomes something because I, I, I use the same idea again and again and then I start to build something out of that idea. So any of these ideas if you use them multiple times in a sequence or somewhere you know in, in, a, in a tune you, you, you try to incorporate a similar idea a few times uh, it's like what was it Robin Ford uh, he was the first one. I bought a, I think it was a, a homespun tape video of him in the 1980s or something. Uh, I don't know if it was homespun or not, but uh, Robin Ford, he was talking about the diminished scale and how he would use it in, in blues. And that helped me a lot, you know, to, to understand uh, how he incorporated, you know, interesting notes to, to his playing. And he also would use them as chords in his structure, you know. Uh, so little ideas. And sometimes you, you, you see the people say, yeah, he's got a specific style. But then when you look at his music theory, what he does, he's not limiting himself to certain ideas, but he likes certain ideas that he repeats and it becomes a style. It becomes, it becomes something. So uh, not just because you know everything and you can use everything all the time, it makes sometimes music also a little watery, you know, it's, you know because it doesn't show your, your preferences. Sometimes people also want to hear your preferences, want to know who you are, what do you like. And uh, it's like with Jim Mills or, you know, Sonny Osborne, they had their style of playing and, and they loved certain things. And Sonny learned a few things, you know, of pedal steelers that were a little bit off the wall, um, and like tritonal substitutions, you know, that he used a lot, you know. It's, a, uh, and it's like a sharp you go to the chord you want to go and it uses the sharp seven nine uh, sharp seven six and uh, you can also find a scale over that but we, we don't want to do that right now but... and he he had things that he's done john hickman had had his little things you know that he came up with uh, uh don reno of course used a lot of six chords uh, or ninth chords you know I use a lot of ninth chords. I like ninth chords, you know, just nine or seven. Uh, that's where a lot of my preferences are. Um, and you will discover them too. Once you start to discover the different flavors and you start, oh, I really like that. And you have a time where you use more augmented, then you have a time where you use more flat, just flat sevens. Then there's a, there's a time where you start using substitutions, you know, like one of my favorite, uh, um, uh, when I go from 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 G, 
to see, you know, if I have a flat nine and that add a six. And I just have this six, this is, sounds so uh, glorious, you know, I go. And it's in particularly beautiful, you know, because I'm, if I'm using this for, and it's like an E chord, it's, it's like, actually it's a flat seven, flat nine, and the six is like a 13, flat nine chord. And, and I go to C here. But I can use it just as, a D, as an E chord. And let's say I'm, I want to resolve that in the key of G, so it will become a B note, a B chord. To G. Okay, so I have minor, E, E, J, let's say I have um, uh, A minor. And instead of using a D chord, I just play a B chord. I just play just a B, a B major. So, you know, that's, that's, that's what I really like. I like that. So, so I use that in all kinds of, I, I, I like that sound. And that's, that's a preference. I discovered it at once, you know, that I, I like that and uh, sort of worked around on that. But again, you see when I do a chord, and that's when you look at a real book and you see, oh, there's, a, there's this chord and you only know it here. There's a C major seven. And then it goes over G major seven. And it goes to C major seven. Well, it's a big jump. And, and it would be good if you know that that C major seven also it may be here, you know, uh, or um, have, have, a, have, a, have a G major seven and then have the C major seven here. So you have a, so you're getting these chords closer and they then just move a lot smoother. So, yeah, something like that. Now, uh, if you just want to, uh, are, are, we, are we in time? Uh, Oh, we're, we're already past our time. I would have loved to talk so much longer to you about all this because it's it's a wonderful world that opens up. So, um, of course, you know, I want to talk to you about how to just play ninth chords and or or the 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 jazz the the, the bebop you know bebop scales you know with flat flat and six and all these connections that you can do. Well, anyway. Uh, for another time, but I hope I was able to inspire you a little bit, and I want to th uh, thank you uh, for being patient with me. I'm not a teacher, um, just a practical musician, I think. Uh, uh, I, I wish you luck with your musical journey. Uh, you know, music is a wonderful thing. Don't take it too seriously, you know. Uh, and if, you know, some guy says, you know, you have to know that. Maybe you don't. And um, and that's the way you have to look at it. Maybe not. You know, uh, there's there's always different ways of looking at it. Well, my brother is a great example, you know, for me a lot of times. He, he doesn't... Um, my brother never, you know, studied music theory like I do, but he is, he is in no way... I mean, he's, he's I think, better musician somehow, you know. I mean, he knows a lot of things, and he plays them intuitively. And I look over when he plays, and I'm like, wow, there's so much joy and so much beautiful music coming out of him, and he just grabs wherever he can, and he doesn't need to necessarily know where it came from. And that's what I like. That's what I liked about Django Reinhardt. That's what I liked about a lot of people. They have simple concepts, but they took them very far with taste, you know, but just listening to sing sing along and knowing what they wanted to hear, I think. And uh, so don't take it serious if you can't grasp all these concepts. And, you know, maybe it's not your time and maybe it's not what you need to know. You know, that's that's all perfectly, perfectly good. But I was hoping that I was in these lessons that I was able to inspire you. And next week we have a question and answer to both of these topics that we talked about today. So what do you think, Dave? This is a fabulous, fabulous lesson. The whole series was, has been has been great. I know everybody's loved it. Um, 
but everybody there's a lot of information especially on the uh on the on the chords on the second half here um so everybody please uh ask, ask your questions right in via email or in the chat um for for next week and we'll, we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can absolutely hey thank you dave i know you're on the other side of the world uh take care we'll see we'll see you we'll see you, we'll see you all next week you all stay safe okay Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.